Well, we are going to get started. I am Raj Kumar, the President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX. Delighted to be with all of you joining us from all over the world. Welcome. I know people are joining us on various platforms. Some of you are tuning in on YouTube. We want to hear from you during the session today. Feel free to put your comments and questions, and we will try to weave them into the discussion as we go, because this is a topic I think that has a lot of interest from people all over the world, regardless what you do in life, whether you are close to issues like population and population statistics, or you're just an average citizen and care about what's gonna happen in terms of population growth or decline in your community or in your country. And if you Google for this topic, you will see so many breathless articles about baby booms or baby busts in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. People are really speculating a lot about what has this pandemic meant? What will it mean as it evolves for population growth? And we have this unique opportunity in this event brought together by UNDESA and the UN Population Fund to talk directly to the experts and to hear from them based on the data that exists and based on their own insights, what might actually be happening? Uh, what do we actually see today? And, and are we looking at a baby boom or a baby bust or something else, something maybe more complicated and nuanced? So I am delighted to get a chance to facilitate a discussion today on this topic. And again, welcome all of you from around the world uh, to have this conversation with us today. And I want to ask Diana Keta, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the UN Population Fund, UNFPA, to, um, to give us some opening thoughts and get us started as we get into this fascinating topic this morning. Thank you very, very much, uh, dear Raj. It's a privilege to have you moderating this. Thank you for being here. Dear John, congrats again for the Commission on Population and Development. This year was fantastic. Esteemed professor, member of the academias, dear colleagues and friends, I am pleased to welcome all of you to this important event to commemorate World Population Day. Population change is one of the greatest mega trend of the 21st century. After decades of sustained population growth, we now face a world in which demographic diversity is the hallmark of our time. While global population growth will continue for decades to come, more than half of the world population now lives in a country with below replacement fertility. Leaders everywhere attend closely to population change because governments must know either the pace of population growth or the pace of population decline in their countries in order to govern effectively. The pace of population change dictates the need for school, for health workers, housing, and the myriad of investment that each government must make to enable development. World Population Day is a moment of celebration indeed. The growth of the human population in the last decades reflects global achievements on many fronts. It reflects enormous progress in global health, a steady reduction in child and adult mortality, and corresponding gains in longevity. We celebrate that more women across the world are empowered to decide on the number and timing of children and enter childbearing without fear of injury or death. We celebrate the contraceptive revolution of the past 50 years and the increasing empowerment of women to control their fertility. We celebrate that more pregnancy are planned and wanted, yet we need to keep in mind all women and men who face fertility challenges. World Population Day also provides a moment to reflect, to reflect on that early dire prediction that population growth would outpace food production did not come to pass. And instead, human ingenuity led to an agricultural revolution resulting in less hunger despite the population growth. These are major, major achievements. 
The theme for this year's population, World Population Day is the impact of COVID-19 on fertility. And we are pleased to be co-hosting this event with the UN Population Division. And we are very proud to have John Wilmot, the director with us today and bringing expert to address this question in a moment of shared trauma and uncertainty. Public health crisis and economic shocks alter reproductive behaviors, leading many people to postpone or curtail childbearing. In countries of Europe, in the United States of America, and in Asia, where most people have sustained access to contraception, we already see such response to the pandemic. But such responsive decisions are not possible for everyone and not so easy in the developing world. While births have declined or pregnancy are postponed in the global north in response to COVID-19, the pandemic has disrupted contraceptive supply chain and reduced access to reproductive health and services in many developing countries. And for some population, unplanned pregnancy have increased. At the moment when the third or fourth wave of COVID and new variant are threatening us all, we welcome this opportunity to recognize our collective resilience and feature critical expertise on how COVID-19 is affecting reproductive rights and choices across the world. Dear friends, your interest underscores the importance of fertility and population change as a mega trend affecting us all. The experts panel gathered here for this event will provide us not only with historic perspectives, but also with new data on how the pandemic is affecting fertility and reproductive rights in a diverse array of countries. As the world copes with the profound uncertainties brought by COVID-19, we are gathered here today to underscore the urgent and critical need to assure that despite the pandemic, everyone in every country can avoid unwanted pregnancy and have the children they want. We cannot allow COVID-19 to interfere with access to reproductive health services or to contraception anywhere. I look forward to a rich discussion on sustaining reproductive rights, enabling everyone to limit unwanted pregnancy but also making sure that wanted children are possible and where having children does not disadvantage a person in realizing their own potential. Society is being put to the test by COVID-19 in both scenarios. I thank you very much. Thank you, DNA. And I think you did a fantastic job laying out for us so many of the key factors at play here, uh, including you know, what are the roles of government in providing health services, and what are the various ways people are experiencing this pandemic? We know that at the very beginning of the pandemic, there was a sense this was going to be the great equalizer, and we would all experience it, and therefore we would all have a sense of common community. But we've seen that so much depends on your level of development and economic conditions and societal conditions heading into the pandemic. And that has had such an impact on how people have experienced this. And so we're going to get into some of these nuances and understand what does the population picture look like by speaking with an incredible array of demographers, population experts around the world. I want to welcome them uh, to our panel conversation. And I'm just going to mention who we have with us today. Christoph Zeman is a research scientist at the Vienna Institute of Demography. Susanna Cavanaghi is the independent researcher in Latin America based in Brazil. She's a, a PhD from the University of Texas and focuses on demography and health. We have Walter Mendoza, who's a population and development analyst at the UN Population Fund based in Peru, covers many countries for UNFPA. Uh, Deda Ogum Alangia is a lecturer uh, based in the Department of Population, Family and Reproductive Health at the School of Public Health at the University of Ghana, joining us from Accra today. We have Mr. Gu Baochang, who's a professor at the Center for Population and Development Studies at Renmin University in China. So it's, a, it's quite an international group that's been assembled, people who are studying this question from many different local and regional contexts. And uh, I want to begin with one more panelist, which is Leticia Mencarini, who is a full professor of demography at Bocconi University in Italy, 
to tell us what you're seeing from your perspective. And maybe, Leticia, you can help us understand what are some of the key factors that you as a demographer look at to understand how the pandemic might play out in fertility rates? Yes, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we, we need to underline that uh, at the moment we can see in terms of births only the result of really the onset of the pandemic. Uh, so what we can do is really uh, try to figure out what uh, it has happened, uh, uh, what are the, the characteristics of the pandemic itself that can uh, affect uh, how pandemic affects fertility, if, if you pass me this uh, double uh, quotation of this effect. Uh, so the characteristics of the epidemic are quite different uh, in some sense from the epidemic of the past. First and foremost, this is a very quick and global epidemic, severe. Uh, its duration is long uh, in several ways and mortality is concentrated among all people. So when we want to consider the consequences, we need to start from these uh, key factors and also from the policy response uh, that everywhere has entailed physical distance and reduced mobility of the population. And then of course, what has already been said, the characteristic of the demographic system uh, and itself, the fact that uh, nowadays, uh, the, there is a great heterogeneity across countries. Uh, there are uh, countries in different stages of their demographic transition, different economic condition. So we cannot have one effect of the pandemic on fertility. And then another important distinction is the fact that we will probably have a short term effect on fertility, but also something that might continue independent of the duration of the pandemic because, for instance, of the economic consequences that this pandemic can have. So in yep. the past, yes. Yeah, I, I think that's a great way to get us, get us started. And maybe, Christoph, I can turn to you because Leticia rightly says we have limited data. That data is based on birth registrations, which not every country has good quality birth registration data. And that is, of course, you know, something nine months later, right, that we see. So we don't necessarily know what the long-term trends are. Uh, but what, what have you seen so far in European data? Um, there is some early data, I understand. What are you seeing at this point, Christoph? Uh, thank you, Raj. Yes, so we are collecting this data for the Human Fertility Database. Uh, as you say, it's mostly Europe, uh, Eastern Asia, uh, US. And it's preliminary data, just uh, simply monthly totals of births, which we compare to the same months one year ago. So it means 2019 and 2020. Well, and uh, simple hypothesis is that nine months after the COVID, uh, we should see some uh, effect kicking in. So if we, if we start with uh, March 2020 as the first uh, COVID uh, pandemic wave, uh, that would be December 2020. And what we see in December, if we, if, we, if we take all last year, there was just some small decline in births, like maybe 3%. But in uh, December, it was already much, much more in, uh, especially in Southern, Southern European country like uh, Portugal, Italy, there was 10% decline in uh, Spain, even 20%. And this decline uh, was continuing in January. But then uh, what we see in February and March is some kind of recuperation. So the number of births go up again. And if you look uh, on, uh, on the relation with COVID, you see that uh, first wave was uh, ending in Europe somewhere around summer. So when you take uh, summer 2020 and nine months, you are in uh, March, for example, March 2021. And here we see that there is no decline already. So it's uh, the births go up. But uh, then the second wave came in uh, autumn 2020. So now we are uh, eagerly awaiting data for May and June. So we will see what will be the next, what will be the next uh, steps in the, in the fertility. Yeah, so it sounds like you're really looking at how the virus has affected individual countries and regions because it hasn't been one steady effect, right? We've had these many waves which have led to lockdowns, economic repercussions. And I guess the underlying hypothesis here is someone trying to make family planning decisions might look at the current state of the virus and think, well, what's gonna to happen to my livelihood? Will I have the money to support 
a growing family? Or also, can I get access to healthcare services or are those not available right now because there's a wave uh, happening? And I guess a, a region that really shows this diversity is Latin America. Maybe it's a good chance to turn to Susana Kavanagi because Latin America is currently experiencing some severe waves of the pandemic. It's not as though, you know, it's all in the past. It's had many cycles. You're based in Brazil, which is, you know, one of the highest mortality rates based on uh, the COVID pandemic. What are you seeing from the Latin America perspective? Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much for you and the PNO FPA for this opportunity. And I think Latin America is a very uh, exemplary case uh, of the diversity we have. Uh, one fact is that uh, birth is still uh, the main component of population change in the region. Although fertility is declining for a long time, it's still um, births are very important. So any changes in birth uh, would change uh, the population growth as a demographic fact. And I think uh, uh, one thing that affects generally fertility in all places is the economic crisis. Uh, and it goes down and up with fluctuations. But in Latin America, with all the uh, inequalities and uh, uh, unstable economic uh, situation in the countries, that seems not to be important. But um, as, um, health factors, shocks uh, do uh, change uh, fluctuations uh, shortly, as Leticia was saying, in, the, in some countries too. But if there is one thing I could say about uh, Latin America is uncertainty. We have uncertainties in our um, spheres. And I would say one thing that is for sure for me, if there is not one size will fit all country in the terms of the impact of uh, COVID uh, in Latin America, but uh, people's life will be affected and changed in, in diverse ways. Why no, Tisa, I want to make sure I, I, I want to interrupt you. I'm sorry, but I just want to understand okay. one thing clearly. Are you suggesting that the economic dislocation of the pandemic maybe has been less of a factor than the health conditions that the pandemic has created in the population. And so when people see a serious wave, the virus is spreading, people are dying, that they reduce their fertility and uh, they make those choices. Is that what you're seeing? Well, what I'm saying is that economic crisis doesn't affect uh, much, uh, fluctuates fertility here, but shocks like Zika and the earthquake in Haiti, uh, it just uh, changed uh, fertility birth no, uh, in, in Latin America and economic crisis, not that much. But COVID is different. And for me, the one of the uncertainty comes from this difference. Uh, this novelty of the COVID that includes our economic, econ uh, social, and health crisis all together in one. So this brings most of the uncertainty. Uh, but also we have uncertainty in the region because of the afterwards of COVID pandemic. We still don't know what is the afterwards. Um, different countries have, impact, have been impacted differently uh, throughout uh, the outbreaks uh, in the region. Uh, we don't know we still we have uncertainties about the immunization, the rhythm of immunization and the new variants. So we might have different impacts in different countries in 2020, in 2021, and still in the 2022 birth uh, uh, rates in, in some regions, uh, in some countries in the region. So these uncertainties come from all the places. Another uncertainty is different political uh, and social answers to the pandemic, and that brings a lot of uncertainty. And I think it's more uh, that relates to economic, but also to how to answer to the health situation in the countries. And another uncertainty we have uh, is about is different from Europe. We still don't have data. And uh, maybe that's a link for someone else to talk about data because in Latin America, we have a disruption of some uh, registration system, but we still have the pre-pandemic situation that is uh, the civil registration and viral statistics are very, um, um, uh, we don't have our coverage. We don't have timely data. So we still don't know. So we have uncertainty about what is going on with this uh, recuperation because we still, in most of the countries, we still don't have reliable data uh, to count on. Yeah, and that, that's such a key factor because as DNA said in the beginning, the world is kind of divided where you have half the population living in countries with long-term fertility declines. And then you have a number, maybe 40 or so poorer countries where you have significant fertility growth. 
-hmm. And it's in those countries where you may have the least access to reliable data. So maybe Walter, you focus on some of these countries. Can you give us a sense in the, in the lesser developed countries, what are you seeing so far in the data around fertility and how it may or may not have changed due to the pandemic? Yeah, well, thanks Raj, thanks colleagues. Um, uh, first, uh, I would just like to, to underscore some very key uh, to sketch the, the situation of the, of the pandemic because there is, uh, most country has different uh, patterns of the pandemic. Some uh, as Peru uh, has two, 200,000 deaths and some others like Cuba in Latin America has had just 2,000 deaths. And Peru population is 33, and Cuba population is 11 million. And so we have Thailand, which has 30, 69 million uh, population, but uh, uh, a pattern of, uh, of the pandemic similar to the one in Cuba, and Bangladesh uh, has a, a, a pattern that uh, uh, has also affected the, 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 the pandemic hasn't been so struck uh, as striking as in Peru. So we have different patterns in the, in the pandemic. And uh, so the, the impact we have seen the, in this year and a half based, based uh, mostly on uh, administrative records is that, for example, in Thailand, nine months after the pandemic, and uh, monthly births in early 2021 uh, declined uh, in comparison to the to the first quarter in 2020, uh, by about uh, 20 and 15 percent in January and February, in Bangladesh, uh, birth show wide fluctuation over time. But available data show that uh, uh, suggests a raise in in 2021 compared to early years. And but in, in Latin America, we have that. In Peru and Cuba, early data so suggests that decline from uh, the end of the 2020 by December to January, February, March 2021, uh, the, uh, in comparison to the same period in the first quarter of, uh, of former year. In, in Peru, we have seen that uh, in this period, there was about 20% uh, of the, in the decline. And this also may be explained by the a lockdown in mid-March last year. And uh, we also have an advantage in Peru, which is the demographic and health survey, which is updated every year. So we notice that because of the less social interaction and the lockdown, uh, sexual, recent sexual activity declined by 50% in all age, age groups, no? So, uh, but uh, what is also important is to uh, highlight that uh, our countries have uh, also different patterns on the demographic. Uh, Cuba was, uh, had a very low fertility rate, about 1.6, which is the same in the last 20, 20 years, unlike so the other countries. No? Right, so what they were going into the pandemic with you know, makes a big difference. And interestingly enough, the, the data you're suggesting we have, the early data from Thailand, sounds kind of similar to what Christoph found in some of the European data, some of the Southern European data, this idea that the immediate onset of the pandemic created uncertainty, led to a decline, 15, 20% decline in, in births and fertility. And, and maybe then as the pandemic goes through waves and we see changes, people respond to those different moments in health. Of course, one of the key factors is do people have access to health services? Can they get access to contraception? Can they get access if they need it to safe abortion? Can they get access to general health and reproductive services? And maybe that's a good uh, point to bring Deda Ogum Alangea into the conversation because Deda, I wonder what you've seen, especially in your region, West Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in terms of access to these basic reproductive health services and their interruption during the pandemic and how might that have been affecting fertility? We're not hearing you if you're there, Deda. Maybe you can un... I have unmuted, yeah. Thank you very much um, for, for the question. Um, listening to what's happening in other parts of the world, I think that um, what's happening in Africa isn't very surprising. 
Um, prior to the COVID outbreak, we've already had issues with most of the health systems in terms of service provision in different aspects. But what is um, quite remarkable with this um, COVID as also could be inferred from the lessons learned from Ebola and other public health emergencies is the massive disruption even in the distribution of um, contraceptive and family planning commodities. Um, also looking at the already weak health systems with um, the countries being um, expected to mobilize health staff to address um, the COVID pandemic, you would see in most places that there were marked reduction in availability of um, most health services, including sexual and reproductive health services. Um, looking at the data, it is quite interesting. You would see that about 50% of the countries assessed, looking at uh, by the UN Women and Joint Joint UN Women and UNFPA assessment, showed that there were massive disruptions. I would like to give you a little bit of um, statistics. If you look at um, outpatient visits, even to SRH services, you would realize there were marked reduction in access. Um, as low as 5% in Zambia, but you could see as high as 48% in Zimbabwe. And if um, outpatient visits are reduced, you can infer that it's referring to family planning services, STI services, abortion and post-abortion care services, prenatal and postnatal care services. And consequently, you would realize that Antenatal care at attendance has reduced in most of the countries, and it's as high as 44% in um, Zimbabwe. Looking at the family planning service, um, of course, data isn't readily available on all methods of contraception. But if you pay attention to injectable contraceptive use that requires a visit to the health facility, you would realize that it, it was um, greatly reduced, about 10% in Tanzania to about 87% in Angola. And this is just for injectable contraceptive use. So I think that the disruption has been massive. We are not able to quantify what the immediate effect would be, but the evidence is clear. And so does that mean... Does that mean you expect to see a baby boom, you know, maybe an increase in teen pregnancy? Do you expect to see something later in the data when we have it six months from now, a year from now? Yes, I should say that with caution because the African continent mostly already has high fertility. That isn't reducing as drastically as observed in other um, countries or other settings. But precisely, if you are having um, a reduction in the services, evidence from Malawi actually is showing an 11% increase in teenage pregnancies just from the school's closure and reduction in access to um, adolescent healthcare services. So I think that, and looking at the non-availability of abortion services, we are going to have a lot more unwanted pregnancies in the system and also unsafe abortions. But looking at the sociocultural reasons or sociocultural explanations to the high fertility on the continent, we, we can't um, say this for everywhere and whether it is just in the medium term or we are going to observe this in the long term, I think we'll need some patience to, to observe that. Understood. Yeah. And those caveats are so important in a discussion like this because we don't really know. We don't have complete data, but it's so interesting to hear the data you do have, especially about outpatient health services, something so many people experience the inability to go visit their doctor for things that weren't urgent or critical. And as you say, often outpatient services in this space and sexual and reproductive health are things like contraception. So very interesting data. And I would love to, to now get a, a chance to hear uh, from our colleague based in China, uh, Gu Bao Chang, about what he's seen in his country, what the picture looks like there. China was obviously affected very early on, contained the virus early. Um, what, what impact, if any, have you seen on fertility there? Are you with us, Scoop? We're not hearing you if you are. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, we hear you now. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to share with you what's going on in China. Uh, this is, in fact, a very special period for China, at least uh, the marvelous speaking, with the outbreak of the pandemic, coronavirus disease. Second, China carried out the census last year, 2020, and the third is a recent government decision uh, to allow people to have three children, not two children, but three children. So all these make a, a, a difference in terms of the amount of changes. And uh, preliminary results from the census recently indicated China's fertility uh, down to 1.3 which shocked uh, many people. And uh, one argued this means China already fallen into the track of low fertility. Of, on the other uh, hand, the people attributed it to the lockdown of the pandemic. Uh, so it's a temp temporary phenomena, may not be the long-term effect. So it uh, have to see uh, if it will be that way. But on the other hand, the births, number of births come down very low. Last year was uh, 12 million, uh, which is uh, uh, more than 2 million less than previous year. And uh, monitoring the system for births, as uh, my colleagues uh, analyzed, uh, at the beginning of the, the first quarter of uh, 2020, uh, marriage registering reduced by 45%. And at the end of the year, uh, the annual births uh, the further shrink uh, by 18% compared to the previous year. So it's hard to distinguish how much is due to the, the pandemic or how, how much is due to this already ongoing trend in China. I mean, uh, downward, what did it? But my guess is because of the pandemic may add an additional fact to accelerate the process towards zero growth in China, towards to the point of depopulation, may come earlier than expected. Hmm. Yeah, that's a fascinating point because you're right, China was already experiencing this massive reduction and maybe the uncertainty around the pandemic uh, could, could bring it even lower, which would be a very shocking result. Uh, thank you for that, that insight into what's happening there. And, and we, we now have a chance to kind of go around and, and hear from all of you again and, and get, a, get a sense to dig a little bit deeper. And I, I want to go back, if, if I can, uh, to Leticia, because, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about national level data and even regional level data, but I think you've got some insights into subnational data and, and what some of that has shown in Italy, where you're based, um, and, and I wonder if you could share that with us today. Yes, I mean, uh, National uh, Statistical Institute has published uh, some uh, disaggregated data about the birth in uh, late this late, last March. And uh, so for the first time, there was uh, an average increase uh, of uh, number of births. So it is uh, um, quite pronounced uh, decrease in number that we have been in, in the month before has uh, been reduced. But what is very interesting is the differences. So the area that they were more uh, affected by mortality that I remember is mortality of, of old people and nothing to do with uh, uh, person in uh, reproductive age, but it did it increase even in March, but it was further decrease. Huh? So the area that they were more affected, it seems to be uh, still uh, nine months early in March when actually the first way was uh, going away and the summer was approaching, but the, 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 the sense of uncertainty was prevailing. But what is most, most interesting is the fact that there was a quite a different uh, uh, rate of uh, re-increase, increase again on, on, on birth for women with high education compared to those with low education. So those who, probably have a less secure job or less secure condition, they were more prudent to 
restart their reproductive uh, projects. And then uh, among immigrants that uh, uh, in Italy account for 15% of the births, so it's a quite uh, an important part of births, there, were, there was still a decrease of number. Uh, so it seems that the reaction and the sense of uncertainty and the fear uh, also of the economic consequences of the pandemic, they play a different role across uh, uh, different parts of population. And this, of course, uh, can uh, increase the disequality. I mean, even fertility behavior can react differently, not only to direct economic consequences that actually they were quite similar throughout the country, but more of the sense of uncertainty that is created by the pandemic itself. I wonder if we can go to others on this exact topic and hear, do, does everyone agree that this that when someone feels uncertain, maybe uncertain about their economic conditions or where or how this virus will develop, that that generally leads to less fertility? Does that, Susanna, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think uh, we have, uh, since the separation of sexual intercourse and reproduction, we have learned that we have, we cannot take for granted access to reproductive health and rights. Uh, it's just not take for granted. If people want to regulate fertility, we have to have the means uh, access to contraception. And access to contraception is not the same for different social groups. Uh, we have people who depends on, uh, uh, and even in different countries, we have different providers. And that I think the pandemic shows us that we have, we knew before, but the pandemic just threw in our faces that we have to have uh, the access to contraception, prenatal uh, services and birth delivery very well planned that that should be apart from uh, what the pandemic or very high infectious disease would uh, have. We have countries need to be prepared for those things because if not, people are going to have fear uh, to have babies. Uh, they are going to have be fear of delivering hospitals. So we have ways to plan and have a very good system for prenatal care uh, and uh, birth delivery. Uh, just one example, in Brazil, we have very high um, hospitalized birth delivery. C-sections are very high in Brazil. If that does not change and people get pregnant and will deliver in hospital and have to get to a hospital where uh, the, the infection are higher, people are going to be afraid and not have babies and not have their lives, uh, even though uh, for a long time, even uh, after the period, if the pandemic takes long to control. So I think what we have to do is to learn that we have not take for granted reproductive health and reproductive rights and to have the systems well prepared for uh, giving access to contraception and the modern contraception to all, uh, to have good access to prenatal services and also uh, to have the, host, uh, the whole health system prepared for, for delivery that is apart from what might be going on with a very highly uh, contagious uh, disease. It's so interesting to hear that from you, Susanna, in a country that's gone through Zika because you know, what you're saying essentially is when we think about the next pandemic and how we prepare our health systems for that, we need to think about sexual and reproductive services as part of pandemic preparedness in a way. If those get interrupted, we have much longer knock-on effects. We are, we are coming very close to the end of our panel discussion. I want to go around and see if there are other comments from people. Christoph, I see you on, on screen. Is there anything you want to add about where you think maybe this is going? You know, the pandemic is not over. Uh, there are still waves in different countries. Um, there's new variants, of course. Delta variant is very much uh, on everyone's minds today. How do you think this, this issue might evolve going forward? Well, I must say, I really think that uncertainty is the, is the main driver of uh, decline in fertility, especially in Europe, in developed countries, uh, in, a, in a short term. But I think in a longer term, uh, the, the, main, uh, the main factor will be the economic impact and uh, I'm afraid that the COVID uh, pandemic itself will deteriorate the uh, economic conditions and labor markets, which then will uh, also um, um, lead to the 
long term uh, further decline of fertility and postponement, especially in uh, some groups. And, and Walter, maybe I can turn to you briefly. Do you think this is going to be a moment we look back on in the countries, especially you're focused on, some of the least developed countries with higher fertility rates? Are you going to be looking back at this 10 years from now and saying this was an inflection point that, that changed something? Or will this end up being a very minor, uh, minor point in the long scheme of things when it comes to birth rates? Well, uh, in countries as, as Cuba, as I said, the, the, the the fertility was uh, was very low, so the fertility rate around one point six, and, and in Peru, uh, actually, it has declined uh, in the last two or three years. Even before the before the pandemic, it was declined. So now, a challenge uh, raised by the pandemic may be the the, the increase on the inequalities, and uh, because uh, the, the wealthy uh, families they may have other resources, so it, it, the, the national average may be the same, maybe follow a trend, but the gaps between the, the haves and have-nots uh, may, may, may increase. And also I would like to, uh, to highlight the, the relevance of the, the impact it has, has on families, because the, the elders have died, but the generational links have been uh, disrupted. And so uh, the, the chain of support in families and, and the, the elders taking care of the babies, that, that, that is not going to be available. So the dynamics of these families is going to be a major issue in the, year, the years to come. That's a fascinating point, Walter, and it connects to what Leticia had to say earlier about in places where the mortality rate was higher, which m mainly is much older people, not for people of reproductive age, it still has an impact on fertility and it's this sense of uncertainty, support systems, very, very interesting point to, to bring to the discussion. Uh, we need to close, but I wanna ask uh, Deda if she has any, any final thoughts based on what she's heard so far, anything she wants to add. Yes, thank you. I think that um, the implications of this for the African continent would depend very much on how much governments respond both to the health system restoration or recovery and the economic recovery. And this is because of the economic underpinnings and the sociocultural um, reasons that fuel the high fertility. If we do not address the economic challenges, we are going to have us go backward and the fertility trend that is stabilized in some places might go up because the children will now it will get some reversal of progress. So I think that governments must rise up quickly, fix the SR, the health system, and specifically sexual and reproductive health care services, and start the economic recovery. Otherwise, we are going to go on an upward trend, I think. Yeah, this is a very important point. We've seen these knock-on effects in other disease areas and other aspects of the health system, and this is a really big one. People don't have access to basic contraception. Um, maybe I can turn to you, Gu, for a last thought. We're really running out of time, but anything else you want to react to from the conversation so far? Gu Bao Chang, if you're on the line, uh, maybe, maybe unmute. We may have we may have lost you, so I'm going to. Um... Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you are. Please. You know, at least in the case of China, China is on already on the way downward in terms of fertility. So the pandemic may add something more. So so it's harder to say anything otherwise. You know, a baby born and also the so far the evidence we have, we we don't see anything will come up the fertility rather than downward. Um, Right, those we, we downward trends may, may actually be accelerated by, by this pandemic. That's right. And on the other hand, because of the family planning service already weakened, uh, because of the discontinuation con, of the one child policy um, terminate. So uh, people thought that since we have so low fertility, uh, we have relaxed the policy why we need a program anymore. So that comes uh, a lot to the problem in terms of, for example, 
the induced abortion increased uh, tremendously in uh, recent years after the policy change uh, from 6 million to 9 million. One third increase, in fact. Mm. So that uh, suggests that the uh, unsatisfied, unmet needs of uh, I think we may have lost uh, Gu Bo Chang for a moment there, but I, I want to thank him. He was talking about the importance of access to health services, including contraception, and what happens when you don't have access. Uh, I just want to thank the, the entire panel. I, I hope you imagine hearing applause, virtual applause, because I think people following Rush, this around the I world are- Can I just say one word that I think we, we have, we're missing here? I, in the long run, I think we need to think about the new generation with the COVID pandemic and all crisis and what is going to happen with the environmental crisis, the new generation will might change their uh, childbearing behavior. So we have to keep that in mind. Yeah, important point, thank you. And, and I do want to, uh, to thank everyone on the panel for a fascinating discussion. Thank everyone who's been following along today for all of your thoughts and ideas. And uh, I do wanna welcome now, um, two additional participants to this discussion to help close us out and give us a sense of what's coming in the future and underline some of the themes I think that came up in the panel today. So John Wilmoth, who's the director of the population division at the UN um, in, in the DESA department and uh, Rachel Snow, who's the chief of population and development branch at UNFPA are with us today and, and welcome to the discussion, both of you, John and Rachel. Um, John, maybe I can turn to you first and just ask you to think about where we're headed. What are sort of, sort of the overarching trends? We've heard a bit about this regionally and, and countries, but what, where, if you had to predict, and it's not easy to do, um, how do you think the overall trends in population will be affected by the COVID pandemic? And you might be muted. We're not hearing you, John. Unmute. Now I'm unmuted, I believe. Thank you, Raj, there you are. so much. Thank you. For, you've done an excellent job moderating. And also I want to thank the, all of the experts who have shared their, their insightful views with us today. Um, <clears throat> as far as what's going to happen, uh, I think we have to anticipate for the next uh, two or three years, maybe even four or five years, that there will be some impact of the pandemic on fertility levels. And the big question, I think, uh, which none of us really know the answer to, is whether this will be, whether this, this will bring long-term impacts uh, that go beyond just the next few years, uh, whether it will be an inflection point, as you've mentioned, whether it would just fundamentally change people's uh, expectations for the future and therefore their decisions around fertility. We just don't know at this point. And I, I would have to say, I, I appreciate all that the experts have said. They've pointed to uh, ways that the pandemic has caused fertility to go up in certain uh, situations or go down in others. In some cases, people are reacting to the uncertainty of the situation. In some, in some cases, their behavior is being affected by uh, the cutoff of, of services, of access to services. And so um, it's really a complex picture out there to try and figure out. At this point, I don't think we've heard any really strong argument to say convincingly that this is going to change long-term fertility trends across the world. So I think for now, where the UN is, is that probably we will continue with our projections to assume uh, you know, a, a blip that will last for a few years, but basically then returning to the trends that we had anticipated before. Of course, I would love to hear from any of these experts if they think that is the wrong thing to do with our projections. We rely on them uh, for these issues. So uh, and I think at that point, I really should end it. I, I want to uh, just point out to everyone that uh, if you didn't hear the, the, the statement by the Secretary General on World Population Day, uh, please keep in mind his, his statement and his call for ensuring access uh, to sexual and reproductive health care and to safeguarding the reproductive rights of all people everywhere. And, thank you, John. Uh, final thank thought. You. Yeah. Thank you for, for underlining that final thought. It's, it's such an important theme in the, in the discussion today. And Rachel, can I turn to you now? Uh, you know, you're at UNFPA responsible for working directly with governments, tracking these kinds of population trends and also working with them on the provision of health services, reproductive and sexual health services. What are your takeaways from the discussion today? What would you like to add? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and first, let me echo the John's compliment to you for, for managing a really diverse and interesting panel. 
I would like to make, I think, just, just two points. And the first is uh, something this pandemic has shown us that arose in the conversation, which is about the, the weakness of the data systems. You know, it exposed a lot on individual inequality in this world. But when we tried to track birth impact here, COVID's impact on birth, I think we have about over 50 program countries in Africa, only three of them had the birth registration data available for us to take a look at that. And, and I think that's a kind of sharp rebuke to all of us uh, in the UN and everywhere, that we are just not building those data systems that give the governments the ability to track and look at this as they need to. And if they can't track birth registrations, as we're talking about today, how well can they track the, you know, the epidemic itself and respond accordingly? Um, but I think the second point has been echoed by, and I'm echoing others, it's, it's that reproductive rights, I think we're reminded, is not just about making sure women can avoid unplanned and unwanted pregnancies which is what we're seeing, of course, right now uh, is raised brilliantly by, by data, but, it, but it's also about the fact that people should be enabled to have children if, if they want a family. And when we see how quickly and, and readily that declines in a moment of crisis, I think it's a reminder to us that these are fragile, sensitive, difficult choices people make, and we're just not able at this point to, to enable lots of people to, to have a certain resilience in that kind of those kind of family decisions, so I think John said it well. It's it's about making sure governments uh, regard reproductive health services as essential in every country, irrespective of crisis. And um, and yeah, and I do worry a little bit about the the young generation. Uh, they were hit by the 2008 recession. Twelve years later, that COVID comes, you really wonder about the the people in their 30s around the world, maybe late 20s and 30s, you know. Will there be a really sustained economic downturn? And if they postponed childbearing, you know, will they miss their chance? So and there's a lot, under, it's a lot an, of challenges. It's understandable, right? It's completely understandable why someone who's gone through those shocks in the economic system and societies might think twice and uh, that we may be seeing that in, in how these longer term trends play out. Thank you so much, Rachel, uh, for putting on this event, for the, those, those insightful comments. And as we just close the session today, I want to turn back to the Deputy um, Executive Director at UNFPA, Diana Keta, who's with us. You, you started us off, Diana, with, with an interesting framework, how we can think about this issue on World Population Day. Help close us out with some final thoughts, please. Thank, thank you so much, Raj. I stayed simply because this is what we live for. This is about population and about fertility. So I learned from all the experts, because that's what we are here. We're all scientists. And uh, I think uh, population is the biggest wealth we all have everywhere. If we have enough senior uh, government official to invest in data, especially in the global South, I think it will make a difference in women's life, in men's life and young people potential to fulfill their own lives later on. So I thank you all. We have a lot of humility because I've learned a lot. And thank you, Raj. It's always a privilege to see you and all of us, thank you so very much. Thank you and thanks again to everyone joining us today as we close out the session. It's been a, a real privilege to hear from all of you on such an important topic. I know I've learned a lot, I'm sure all of you have as well. Thank you to everyone and be well. <laughs>